Welcome back. I'm talking with Representative Judy Boyle from District 9 here in Idaho and to Alan Hodge, who is a student of Tom Woods and has studied his book, Nullification, and taken his course, in fact. And uh, prior to the break, we were talking about the fact that some people use uh, the idea of nullification, saying that it was used to promote slavery. And yet, Tom Woods talks about how it's just the opposite, and, and he cites the Joshua Glover case. Would you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, it, it's a very interesting case, and it's one of those things that Thomas Woods had talked about has fallen down the Orwellian memory hole uh, in terms of American history. He cited several things that have, where, where history has given this whole topic short shrift. And, uh, I think that that uh, the Joshua Glover case is one in point, but it even goes back that there were several other cases that the term nullification, any time that the, ter the word states uh, gets invoked, that people tend to automatically, or students are automatically trained almost, like Pavlov's dog, to is, that states are somehow afforded uh, sinister motives for doing so. And it's true that states can and have occasionally abuse their power. Nobody denies that. But the United States government has abused its power as well. And so therefore, that's why we need a system of checks and balances. And the states are every bit as much a part of that as the federal government is. So in the Joshua Glover case, uh, and we've had several examples where nullification or interposition was invoked during American history, uh, right from the beginning, from 1798 on. I mean, in defense of freedom of speech, in, f in defense of free trade, in defense of uh, you know, uh, opposing illegal search and seizures. Um, it was even used against military conscription. Uh, but in, in particular, uh, this particular case involving Joshua Glover stemmed from the um, Fugitive Slave Act that was passed in the year 1850. Well, in 1854, Joshua Glover, a black man, uh, a free person of color, as they were known then, uh, living in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, in fact, um, was arrested and put in jail uh, under suspicion of being a fugitive slave and not a free man. And uh, uh, they were going to extradite him under the, the, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act to the, his former state, or what was purported to be his former state, which I believe was Missouri at the time. Well, as it turns out, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act, the way, it, uh, the way it was written, really gave somebody who wanted to point somebody out as a fugitive slave, could say, well, you know, that guy there kind of looks like a fugitive slave to me. And they could literally, literally kidnap the guy and spirit him off back to the South and turn him to slavery. Well. You know, the northern states in particular took a, a particular offense at this, and, and uh, when Joshua Glover was put in jail, uh, the Milwaukee newspaper editor uh, at the time, uh, Sherman Booth, uh, uh, got wind of it. And uh, so he had to start a distributing handbill saying, hey, look, they got Joshua Glover, who was a, actually a fairly prominent citizen, or at least a well-liked citizen in the, in the city of Milwaukee at the time. They got him in jail here. They're going to haul him off. And, uh, and uh, so he, he went around town distributing handbills and then finally ran out of patience and he started riding the streets on his horse saying a man's liberty is at stake. Well, pretty soon a crowd uh, gathered outside the jail because Wisconsin state law said, no, you're not going to extradite somebody out of the state unless they first stand trial. He may be a fugitive slave. We don't know that. You've got to prove it first because unfortunately slavery was legal at the time and in fact there was even a constitutional provision to return slaves to the south but the fugitive slave act itself and the way it was Im imposed was in the opinion of the state of wisconsin and other states a violation of the constitution and the man's constitutional rights to a fair trial so what ended up happening is that this crowd developed outside the uh, jail and they, uh, after hearing the speech from J Sherman Booth, the crowd just broke into the jail and they set Joshua Glover free. They turned him loose. Well, then some federal marshals came along and arrested Sherman Booth for inciting this crowd. And uh, this whole episode lasted for several years. But in the end, uh, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court 
essentially issued a ruling declaring the Fugitive Slave Act unconstitutional. This is the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, not mm -hmm. the U.S. Federal Supreme Court. The U.S. Federal and the Supreme Court, in fact, had already ruled that that, that law was constitutional. So that the state of Wisconsin actually stood in defiance of the federal law declaring that the Fugitive Slave Act unconstitutional. Joshua Glover never went back to jail. And he was never returned to slavery. We don't know what happened to him. We think he may have escaped to Canada, but we don't know for sure. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Well, you know, if, um, if these opinions that, and it's not just um, our, our state attorney general, I've heard others say it too on different programs, you know, where they always quote the supremacy clause. But it seems to me that if the federal government has that much power, then why do we even need state legislatures? I mean, mm -hmm. if we don't have the power to say to the feds, we don't like your law, it doesn't apply to us, then they can write anything they want and we're, we become subjects again. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the whole reason we became what we are, um, not to be ruled, but to be governed. Um, so. I don't ever hear um, in the opinions that being covered that if we, if the states really don't have any right to mm -hmm. say to the feds that doesn't apply here, then they can do whatever they want. They can just run right over us. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So, um, Representative Boyle, you and Representative Barbieri, and on the Senate side, it's. Uh, Senator Pierce, mm -hmm. Monty Pierce, are all working to get this House Bill 59 through, and should this pass and the, and the governor sign it, what does that mean? That means that state agencies cannot accept money to implement this federal law, and they can't expend money, they can't move forward with it. It's null and void. And it, is it not, it, if I read it correctly, it's a misdemeanor if anybody forces any citizen to, um, to comply with That's certain uh, requirements that they have to have this, uh, not only this kind of insurance, but maybe even from this insurer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, <laughs> that just seems amazing that they could do that anyway. But, it does. Um, yeah. But if you, if you read the health care law, not only does the national health care law mandate these things, but there's over 100, I think something like 156 new agencies yes. that will come into effect. Each one of those agencies have to be funded. They have to be staffed. Mm -hmm. And who knows what cool little programs they're going to come up with. And what kind of rules they're going to write. Right. That's right. Promulgated, too. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, well, there's a lot uh, to this, and uh, uh, one of the things that I wanted to discuss briefly, too, is the fact that not only is it unprecedented to have both the House and Senate um, Education Committees meet, but the House and Senate Health and Welfare Committees meet, and have public input to JFAC this earlier. So when we come back from the break, I'd like to talk about the fact that this legislature seems more um, uh, active, proactive, saying we want to get the people involved and engaged. And I think it's great that you guys are doing that. We'll be right back.